from the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. The censorship of art is nothing new. Shortly after Michelangelo finished painting The Last Judgment on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel back in 1541, church conservatives took exception to the painting's many nude figures. A year after Michelangelo's death, one of his former students was hired to paint pants and loincloths on some of those depicted. So some things haven't changed in 500 years. Nudity and sexuality in art is still controversial. Yet around the world, artistic censorship is taking some new forms. As Instagram has become one of the major ways that people consume visual arts, computer algorithms now play a role in censoring what is unacceptable. Anti-terrorism laws have been used to silence or jail artists in countries like Spain and Turkey, and the recent rise of far-right political movements in Europe has brought new forms of censorship in Hungary, Poland, and other nations. So on this edition of Global Journalist, a look at some new trends in artistic censorship. To kick things off, we'll start here in the United States. And for this, we're joined from New York by Nora Pelizari. She's the communications director at the National Coalition Against Censorship. Nora, welcome. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. I mean, first of all, we should start by saying that the U.S. has one of the most broad protections for, uh, for artists of any country in the world. That's absolutely true. Um, when we talk about kind of the legal background of uh, free expression protection in the United States, we're talking primarily about the First Amendment. Um, the First Amendment protects a broad range of speech, um, including visual and artistic expression, as well as literal speech. Um, the sort of categories of speech that are unprotected are pretty specific and very much include um, incitement to sort of immediate violence um, and sort of things of that nature. But in general, the First Amendment um, protects your ability to say things that are unpopular or offensive. Um, what it does not protect is your right to not be offended. Um, that is what you don't have in well, the United States. We should say that a fair amount of your organization's advocacy campaigns, they target libraries and school districts for banning books and literature mm -hmm. with controversial themes. Give, give us just a couple examples. Sure. So we've been around since 1974. So we've been doing this work for 45 years. And the books that get challenged change a little bit over time, but not all that much as well. So it's not the catcher um, in the rye anymore. Uh, it's To Kill a Mockingbird, it's Huckleberry Finn, um, and it's a lot of more recent kind of young adult fiction. Um, in the last several years, we've seen an interesting mix of challenges to books in schools and libraries, uh, ranging from, you know, parents who don't think that their children should have to read the sort of historically accurate but racially offensive language in books like To Kill a Mockingbird and Huckleberry Finn, up to... Last summer, um, a fraternal order of police in Charleston, South Carolina, challenged the inclusion of two young adult novels that tell stories of police violence from the point of view of black characters written by black authors that were wildly popular and hugely critically acclaimed and very balanced books. But the police felt that they uh, weren't appropriate to be on a high school summer optional reading list. Well, well, let um, me. Well, I wanted to ask you as well because it seems like there's a lot of uh, literature with LGBTQ themes as well that is that that are, that are being challenged, but and it, that makes sense in a way given sort of the transformation of of attitudes uh, over the past decade or two in the U.S. Absolutely, that's a very timely question. That just this week we've had uh, we've been working on three different cases of LGBT books being challenged in um, libraries and school libraries. Um, the argument is generally some sort of very common censorship argument about protecting children. Um, but really the issue is the right to access information. And some and of these right are children's books. Like I think one of the ones that you had yeah. worked on was called The Knight and the Prince. And it was okay. actually about uh, a prince's mm -hmm. search for a soulmate who and mm -hmm. he ultimately found a knight as his, yeah. as his romantic partner. Absolutely. The other big one on the list right now is called My Princess Boy, which is about a little boy who likes to wear dresses. That's the extent of the book. It's a lovely children's book. Another one recently is called Rainbow, and it's about 
actually the colors of the rainbow, um, and it happens to be a sort of gentle introduction to pride as well. Um, so there's no actual sexual content in these books. These are picture books, um, and parents feel, some parents feel, that uh, they shouldn't be accessible to children. Well, I mean, in some ways, uh, sort of the themes under dispute are new, but it still feels like these are sort of traditional examples of mm -hmm. censorship. So I want to ask you a bit about some of the controversy about Instagram in particular, because Instagram has become such a powerful platform for artists, particularly visual artists, and what Instagram censors and how is it how it goes about doing that. Talk to mm -hmm. us about that. Where wh where is where is that particularly problematic? Well, it's problematic all over the world because of Instagram's reach. And I think that we have to think about what the benefit to artists is of Instagram and why that makes their censorship so difficult. Um, the benefit to artists is that Instagram is a platform for those who don't have access to traditional kind of art world platforms, right? Anyone has access to Instagram and can build an audience without sort of the traditional methods of going about entering the quote unquote art world. Um, so you so don't need a, like a, an agent media. in New York in a solo Absolutely. exhibition at a, a yeah. gallery in the right spot. And... Yeah. And it allows people to find an audience of others who want to view their art. And we have found that the artists who are most affected are artists who come from already marginalized communities. So artists who are trying to use their art to explore gender fluidity or gender expression uh, really come up against it when we're talking about Instagram's nudity restrictions. And Instagram has very, very vague guidelines on the word that we love the most, inappropriate um, content, which doesn't mean anything and is a sort of undefined inappropriateness that Instagram uses not to necessarily remove the content, but to make sure that it's undiscoverable. Well, I want to I want to pick up on on this issue uh, later on in the show, but I did I did want to ask you about one of your campaigns here uh, that you ran that, that targeted Facebook and Instagram, which is called We the Nipple. Talk talk mm -hmm. to us about that. Well, you know, We the Nipple was a campaign that addressed a very specific ban on Instagram, which is the banning of specifically female nipples. The first obvious problem with that is how Instagram knows when someone's nipple is female um, because nipples all look the same. So how Instagram is determining gender for users is a big question mark. And that's why this campaign was really important to gender nonconforming artists and artists who use their work to kind of explore ideas of the body. So we worked with, um, photographer Spencer Tunick, and we got 125 people to pose nude in front of the Instagram headquarters in New York, um, covering their nipples with images of male nipples. So all participants um, were technically displaying male nipples. And because should they were wearing stickers answer. over their own nipples of male nipples. They were. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, this, this was quite clever here, but unfortunately, <laughs> we're just out of time. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us, Nora. Thank you. A reminder that this is Global Journalist. On today's program, we're talking about trends and the ways in which artists face censorship today. We're going to hear. We're going to move our discussion more globally now to talk about artistic censorship internationally. And for that, we're joined by Srirak Plipat in Copenhagen. He's the executive director of Free Muse, an organization that advocates for artistic freedom. Srirak, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, one of the things your organization does is try to measure the state of artistic freedom all around the world. How do, how do you go about doing that? We um, document, we use all sources online, offline, um, from various parts of the world um, to identify cases of violation of artistic freedom. So every year we document so roughly about 600 cases from 80 countries. Then we analyze what kind of patterns, if there's new trends in censorship, um, in terms of uh, different ways of restricting artistic freedom as the world developed uh, in the current situation. So those are the day-to-day -day work that we have done. Uh, by the end of the year, we publish the uh, annual State of Artistic Freedom Report and advocate for uh, the rights of artists um, through international, regional, and national levels. Okay, and so these can be writers, 
poets, visual artists, actors, mm. and the types of violations you're talking about can be artists being imprisoned or music being banned. Or, so there's sort of like a wide range of different types of violations then. Yes, absolutely. Um, from certainly the, the more serious is when artists get killed because of their express themselves artistically. And certainly very similar, we notice increasing trends of uh, increasing number of artists being prosecuted for expressing themselves, um, even though international laws and national laws uh, guarantee the right to free expression, including artistic expression and creativity. But in practice, this, uh, uh, this law tend not to work uh, in many countries in the global south, as well as in the north, um, North America, Western Europe, I think we fall into a bit of a alarming trends overall when we look at what happened in the past few years. Well, I would, that's um, I what, what I want to ask you is like, is this is this actually getting worse? Is is this this issue in, of censorship? Indeed, I think we put it quite broadly. Uh, most of the uh, repressive regimes in many parts of the world um, basically stay the same. Um, whether it's China, Russia, Iran, Egypt, for example, um, you've seen limited change in this front. At the same time, in Northern America, Western Europe, uh, the growth of nationalism, populism, uh, political narratives has enabling more of a restriction of artistic freedom. Um, so that's make these two forces making the current global trends seems to be at a, a new low point. Um, and we don't see any evidence of a significant improvement overall. So while the, our weekly monitoring, I think there's a quite a grim picture overall at the moment. Well, give us just a couple examples of, of countries that you would highlight then where, where this has been particularly a, a problem in recent years. Um, certainly in many parts, and I have to say um, by giving some example, um, it just happened all over the world in over 80 countries. In Turkey, we've seen very alarming um, development after the coup in particular, where journalists, artists, um, civil society groups, human rights organizations, are being locked up for expressing themselves. Some of them are being accused of being a member of terrorism organization. And many artists in, uh, increasingly being prosecuted um, on the ground of anti-terrorism. Um, and that's going up to 9% of all the cases that we've seen recently. And that's the importance also that we have been raising that um, uh, human rights cannot be compromised in the name of security either. Um, Egypt, very strong laws in Iran, similarly. Uh, Russia, where a number of uh, cases has really limited on the ground of hurting religions, feeling um, or for opposing governments, um, continue to be a classic cases. Well, I wanted to. Um, I actually wanted to raise one particular country with you that uh, may surprise some yeah. people, and that is Spain. Can you talk to us about how anti-terrorism laws there have been used against musicians? Indeed, um, we are particular concern on Spain is giving 14 rappers now have been sentenced to imprisonment, um, and that makes the highest um, imprisonment sentence on Arctic freedom in uh, the last two years. And why why are um, rappers in Spain being targeted by the government? They have been accused of um, insulting victims of terrorism and insulting um, royal family members. Um, while there are this law that's being protected um, on defamation cases, for example, and a number of increasing cases the government have used is on the ground of hate speech and incitement of violence. And uh, this needs to be verified to particular tests uh, under international law. Um, you cannot just say this piece of artwork or music or song are hate speech because you feel it sounds like hate speech. Um, you need to pass the test of the necessity, the context the artist used, how likelihood that um, people, audience will follow all of his uh, songs or what the message has been carried out. So those have been one of the main grounds, um, the anti-terrorism law, the criminal courts uh, that Spain has had in the past, and now it's being reactivated and used against artists in the current political climate. So that's a, a worrying trend in these countries. Well, Sri Rak Plipat, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Yeah, thank you. A reminder that you're tuned into Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's program, a, new, a look at new trends in the censorship of art. 
from far-right political movements to social media algorithms, the art we consume is being censored in ways few would have envisioned 20 years ago. If you're interested in more Global Journalists, check us out online at globaljournalist.org. There you can find our archives and additional coverage of underreported international news and human rights issues. You can also like us on Facebook, where we live stream. Follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, or see our videocast on YouTube. Now, for our last segment, we're going to turn the discussion to focus more on Europe now, where there's been a particularly robust debate on this issue. Uh, For that, we're pleased to be joined from Berlin, Germany, by the art critic and journalist Hilly Perlson. Hilly, welcome. And with us from Moscow is Dorian Batika. He's a correspondent for the online arts publication Hyper Allergic. Dorian, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Jason. Well, it's a pleasure to have you both. Hilly Perlson, let me start with you. You have covered censorship for a number of different publications. One of the incidents you covered recently was this uproar in Poland, which has a populist right-wing government. And the art at issue was uh, a black and white video from the 1970s by a feminist artist, Natalia LL. Tell us, tell us about that video and why it raised such a ruckus in Poland. Um, Yeah, I think this incident also shows, I mean, apart from the censorship, I just want to highlight that this incident also shows how deeply involved uh, Polish people are with with this um, protest movement. So they didn't go without a fight for that. Um, So since the government, the PIS government, um, came to power in 2015, they have been replacing um, a number of directors of cultural institutions, including at the museum, the National Museum in Warsaw. Around May this year, this work was removed from one of the galleries. And we should, I'm sorry, for our listeners who may not be familiar with this work, we should just describe it. It's a black and white video uh, in which a woman is right. eating a banana in a very sexually suggestive way. But there's, uh, for most of the video, there's there's no nudity. There is no nudity, and it's done in the, in you know the spirit of the time um, of the gender wars. Um, it's done as a critique of the way women were portrayed in advertisement, in the media, in society, the expectations from you know beauty, beauty magazines, and so on. It's not different from a lot of the feminist avant-garde art that we, we saw everywhere else in the world around that time. Um, and the video does not show any nudity. It is mostly, you know, suggestive in the eyes of the beholder. Um, and the video, along with two other works by feminist artists, was removed for, from um, permanent display. Um, the explanation was that this might be disturbing for children and that certain gender issues should not be discussed. And I mean, this led to this yeah. led to some widespread public protests here. And Dorian Batika, if I could bring you, and this is something that you that you have written about and covered as well. Uh, I mean, talk to us just a little bit about how this became sort of a flashpoint in 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 Poland. Right. Well, I think that there is an important distinction, first of all, to me, in between, let's say, Western and Eastern Europe. And uh, there's a qualitative difference between forms of uh, like overt state censorship uh, through violence and coercion and sort of uh, self-censorship. And I think in Poland, there is a general consensus around um, this uh, sort of nationalist impulse around protecting traditional Polish family values. And anything that sort of is counter to that is subject to uh, to a conservative um, sort of far right backlash. So this involves uh, LGBTQ issues. This involves issues uh, around uh, quintessential Polishness. So uh, recently, a case I covered was uh, involving the CCA Ujazdowski Castle in Warsaw, uh, one of the most preeminent uh, institutions for contemporary art in Warsaw, in which uh, the director uh, was recently sort of uh, given uh, a replacement notice by the Ministry of Culture, despite having widespread support from staff, uh, widespread support from media, very strong exhibitions. And so I think what happens in Poland is you have a sort of government that is uh, allowing itself to create more um, 
to create the conditions in which they're able to replace directors with near impunity. And this creates a sort of climate of self-censorship where directors uh, of perhaps smaller institutions are fearful of programming different types of content that may run counter to government ideology, which in this case is, is, is very much promoting nationalist traditional Polish family values. Well, Dorian, I mean, this is quite interesting because if governments control who the directors of art museums are, they're, they're able to control the gatekeepers of what is displayed in museums. But in some ways, like this form of censorship, it feels quite dated. I mean, in the United States, uh, Hilly Pearson, maybe if you want to pick up on this idea, 25 years ago, there were some major obscenity prosecutions where the government would uh, in various ways try to prosecute artists like uh, the famous artist Robert Mapplethorpe for uh, creating art that was deemed obscene. But obviously in the age of the internet, people have access to so many different images that they never would have 20 years ago or 25 years ago that are uh, graphic and sexually suggestive uh, in, in ways that would have been inconceivable 20 or 30 years ago. How is it that uh, how is it that governments are still trying to control what people view in museums? Does, does that still make sense? Well, it makes sense in the wider context of seeing other changes that, is, that have happened in culture in the country since 2015. And I think this in particular has to do also with the fact that um, Poland has one of the most strictest abortion laws in the world. And that is also being protested against and discussed. Women go out on the streets in March. Um, and I see this particular incident that, you know, I totally agree, it doesn't make much sense to censor a work in, you know, a black and white small screen um, in a gallery. Um, but I see it as a wider statement about, you know, the place in, of women in society. And, and it's a, indeed a very oppressive, very violent act. And that's exactly how Polish women also perceived it. They responded immediately to the backlash, the protests, the viral, um, you know, there was a hashtag, I think, banana selfie uh, and Je suis banane were the two hashtags that kind of ignited this widespread protest on social media where Polish women and men as well uh, filmed themselves eating bananas and mocking the government. Well, Dorian Batika, I mean, you mentioned uh, sort of a qualitative difference in the way that art is censored in Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Can you give us a few more examples from Poland, from Central and Eastern Europe that have been particularly problematic? This issue uh, about the banana video in, in, the muse in the National Museum in Poland was widely covered around the world, but give us a few that maybe flew under the radar. Certainly. Well, there was the case of the uh, European Solidi Solidarity Center in, in Gdansk, who uh, a similar case, who uh, the contract of the director was uh, it expired and it wasn't renewed. There was the uh, the you know the history, the Museum of the History of Polish Jews under similar circumstances. And, uh, you know, apart from Poland, you know, you have like the gay propaganda law in Russia, you have these uh, sort of laws that are used to uh, restrict uh, freedom of speech and expression under traditional family values. So you have this sort of uh, trend where uh, more authoritarian countries will use the law and use the sort of tools of the law to create a censorious climate. And what you see is a trickle down effect. So you have, uh, let's say, countries that relate very high on the scale of censorship and state control like Russia and Turkey, and their, their programs that they use to control censorship sort of trickle down uh, to, to the West. And, and you sort of see this time and time again with uh, censorious laws that are enacted in different parts <laughs> of the world that are well, more or less replicated in different in, in other countries. So in Poland, uh, other examples were, you know, uh, the Starry Theater, the Bunkerstrutki in Krakow, which had their funding uh, sort of diminished. You had uh, other examples involving film festivals, theater festivals. And it's sort of the, 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 the program that is now more or less the soup du jour, you could say, of, of Polish cultural politics is, uh, you know, to, to bait and switch. Well, Hilly Pearl said, I mean, the ways in which we've been talking about censorship in Europe now have been, they've been sort of traditional in that it's, it sounds like a clash between conservative religious authorities and sort of progressive left-wing artists. I mean, it, does that, does that capture the entirety of, of this issue? 
Well, with the example of Poland, I would say definitely. Um, I'd also like to bring up an earlier example in 2015, where the Polish Cultural Institute in Berlin um, um, replaced its director because, you know, the official explanation was different. However, when internal communication came to light, it sounded like she had been fired because her content of the programming in Berlin was too heavily um, focused on the Holocaust. So there is, you know, also the two examples that Dorian named um, have to do a little bit with um, almost revisionism um, and kind of an attempt to highlight Poland, Polish heroism during World War II. Um, and I think this is very much related to um, a, a shift towards right-wing extremism in parts of Europe. Yeah, Dorian Batika, if, if you could go ahead and pick up on that. Sure. I mean, it, it, it's absolutely true what Hilly is saying. And I think that touching on that, you do, again, see this sort of trickle down. So you see it moving from countries like Russia further and further west. And I think this is the extreme danger, is that you have a sort of blueprint of censorship that exists. And, it, and, I, and I think that today we're in a very dangerous Orwellian dystopia where there's an illiberal wave that is sort of sweeping Europe and sweeping the West. And that I think many leaders, including Donald Trump, including big leaders in the West, they're looking at these very authoritarian countries as a sort of blueprint for them to to enact these programs and through insidious measures of, of funding, controlling finance, controlling, basically controlling the economics of institutions, you're effectively able to control the programming and the ideological content of them too. Well, Dorian, if I could stay with you, our time does grow short, but a lot of the justifications that have been used to challenge art involve obscenity. Uh, but I think, especially in Western Europe, the way people view what uh, is obscene uh, versus the way that Americans view it is quite different in some sense. I mean, can you give us just uh, can you give us just a sense as to how that plays out in sort of the legal black background? Well, I mean, you you have certainly no shortage of cases involving, uh, let's say, hate speech. You know, there was the famous case of Charlie Hebdo, which had this uh, you know, cartoon depicting the Prophet Muhammad on the cover. And I think there are important distinctions to be made between hate speech on the one hand and censorship on the other hand. So I think that there is a sort of um, a nuance there between understanding uh, sort of sensitivity to freedom of speech and freedom of expression and hate speech. And I think a lot of uh, the discourse, let's say, around censorship today is promoting this idea of unequivocal free speech, unequivocal freedom of expression, which, uh, as we've seen time and time again, can often wade into the very dangerous waters of hate speech. And I think this is where uh, many people who are discussing censorship and discussing even self-censorship, this is where things get a bit tricky and a bit more murky. Well, we're out of time for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Nora Palazzari, Surak Plipat, Hilly Perlson, and Dorian Batika. Our assistant producers this week are Laura Miserez and Ariana Suardi. Trevor Hook is our supervising producer, and Kyle McCubbin is visual editor. Takia Thomas is audio engineer. Kathy Kiley is executive editor. Travis McMillan is director. For all of us at Global Journalists, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.